Hello, everybody. I think I met Peter uh, 13, 14 years ago. Uh, I was working at Wired Magazine, and we were, uh, I was working on the web properties of Wired Magazine. And we were doing our first ever usability test for some new stuff that we were wor working on. And our first ever user who came in to sat, sit down there was Peter. Um, <laughs> and I remember, like, I was behind the glass, right, watching him. And he basically told us he couldn't make sense of anything that we were doing, and none of it. But, and I was like, who is this guy? Like, saying all this stuff. I, don't th I think for about two years afterwards, we never did any more usability testing, because I was always like, ah, the users are way too obnoxious when they come in. So, <laughs> so that's my story of meeting Peter. Um, yeah, so I picked a small topic for the 30 minutes that we have today. Um, but I think we could get through it pretty quickly. Um, yeah, so you know, Peter and I and a bunch of other people co-founded Adaptive Path. Um, Adaptive Path has done a lot of stuff uh, in the almost, geez, almost 10 years since we, since we started it. Um, but I think fundamentally at the core was always the web. Um, we moved into you know, user research and strategic business strategy and uh, service design and all that kind of stuff. But at the core, we started, we did stuff on the web. Um, and I think almost every project today always has that at the core. Um, my career has gone in different directions. and I'm working on a bunch of new stuff, but it's all about this thing we call the web and this platform that we've created. And I want to tell you a few stories about uh, about a bunch of different things, all relating to, I think, a uh, fundamental thesis, which is that if we can understand the way the web works and we try to work in the same way, we're going to be a lot more successful. Um, and so the first story I want to tell you about, actually, is about beer. Are there any uh, fans of beer in the audience here? Hey, look, <laughs> turns out. Um, I am a big fan of beer. Uh, in fact, I travel a lot um, uh, for work and, and uh, one of the things I do when I go to a new city is to figure out, like, you know, what are they making here? Because there's been this sort of renaissance of craft microbrew. Um, and it's a good way to sort of get to know an area to see the kind of beer that they're making and what's popular. Um, and uh, so for those of you out of town coming here to my city, uh, San Francisco, uh, if you were to go to a place that specializes in beer, like, for example, Magnolia's in the Haight, or also in the Haight, um, the Toronado, you will find um, that people that are really into beer will go to places that have beer on hand pump, right, coming straight out of the cask, served at room temperature, almost flat. It is a very, very traditional way of making beer. Um, it looks something like this, right, from, this, this, uh, from hundreds of years ago, how they, how they sort of made beer that way because there was no refrigeration, which is kind of obvious, right? There's no, you know, electricity, refrigeration, all that kind of stuff came much later. But it, it sort of uh, informed how they made beer and how they sort of kept it, preserved it, and how it tasted then, and we can sort of get a, get a sense of that. Um, but that idea that like, things couldn't be cold right? before oh, about 200 years ago, really, um, there was no way to make anything cold uh, fascinates me because there's a story about ice that, um, uh, that really sort of resonates around this idea of technological progress. So 200 years ago, um, you couldn't get a glass of cold lemonade on a hot summer day like today. The only people who really had ice were the very wealthy who had ponds on their, um, on their land that would freeze over in the winter, and then they'd hire a bunch of workers to go out and saw the ice off of the pond, dig big holes, put all the ice in there and like insulate it with hay and stuff, and then see how long they could make it last over the summer so they could have fancy parties and you know, drop uh, uh, ice cubes into people's glasses. Um, that was literally the only way in the summertime, like in New England, that you could have a cold drink. Um, that, uh, turned out, was a business opportunity for a guy named Frederick Tudor. Uh, Frederick Tudor uh, said, you know, this is awesome that people, like, people really want to have cold drinks or, or preserve their food or things like that. Let's see if we can apply some technology and, and maybe think about the business model here in a way that uh, we could get this out to more people than just the wealthy landowners. So he uh, innovated in a few ways. He made a, a, a sort of ice plow that he could hook up to horses that, that can, you know, did the work of 10 men. But his real innovation was shipping, right? He realized that we could, he could effectively build these ships that were so well insulated, he could get the ice from New England down to places where it was hot all the time. And so he began to ship ice down to places like the Bahamas, uh, Cuba, uh, even out to London. He was able to sort of work out the timetable to get ice over there. There's records of Queen Victoria um, buying ice from Frederick Tudor to serve at the palace. Um, he even, uh, for a while, shipped ice all the way to Calcutta. Uh, and there wasn't much left when it got there, but there was enough to actually turn a profit and to do that. Um, some of this ice he harvested right off of Walden Pond. And um, 
Uh, and this comes from the book of the same name here, uh, writing, The Sweltering Inhabitants of Charleston, New Orleans, Madras, and Bombay, and Calcutta Drink at My Well. The pure Walden water is mingled with the sacred water of Ganges. And I think here that uh, he was really uh, talk, using some poetic language to talk about peeing in the river. But regardless, uh, <laughs> it was a thing, right? It was actually, it turned out to be a pretty big part of the New England economy, was the sh shipping and storage of ice harvested from ponds. Um, there's uh, uh, lots of historical evidence, um, and uh, Tudor became wealthy, became the sort of ice king of New England. Um, but as you can imagine, technology marches on, right? So his shipping and his storage of ice uh, was only innovative for so long. Uh, later in the 19th century, around the 1850s or so, there was a guy named Dr. John Gorey. He was an epidemiologist who studied communicable diseases in the tropics. Um, and did a lot of work in Florida, trying to figure out how these diseases were different from diseases elsewhere. And this hypothesis was around, you know, the heat and humidity made them, made them more severe and made them propagate faster, these, uh, these tropical diseases. And so he started to work on a technology for getting his hospital wards to cool down um, and invented the first mechanical refrigeration, or at least was awarded one of the first patents. Many people were working on this at the time, but it quickly took off, right? Uh, the result being that it was able to be commercialized in cities uh, and ice houses kind of cropped up everywhere, uh, meaning they could have these big giant uh, uh, refrigeration units that spit out blocks of ice uh, and they could store them here and they could make them year round and they start, would start delivery service and, um, and people could have ice in their homes and drove the price down to about a penny a pound and, um, and included the development of the ice box where people could keep food uh, and keep ice uh, so that the, you know, they could have regular deliveries, um, and, and this was very successful. Uh, this was sort of the next generation of how refrigeration was working. But as you can imagine, right, technology, just like today, just like all the little devices you got in your pocket uh, and the laptops in front of you, uh, every iteration of this technology meant that the price came down and, the, and that the devices got smaller, uh, to the point where you could actually take one of those big machines and put it in your house. And now we have sort of the democratization of refrigeration, where anybody can make ice now. Uh, and it doesn't require a distribution network or big warehouses or anything like that. Here's a, something from the uh, 1920s in the GE catalog, um, talking about the old-fashioned kitchen full of work, full of work, the hundreds of lost hours, the result of lost youth and beauty, and then you can imagine, <laughs> boom, right? The new eye kitchen. Look at this. Here we go, the modern GE kitchen, which will easily pay for itself over time. So, uh, you know, the marketing that we see today in technology, no different from the marketing in the past. Uh, but this was insanely successful, right? Like it turned GE into one of the biggest companies in the world, um, uh, manufacturing all kinds, all sorts of appliances, but really starting with refrigeration. So the reason this is interesting to me is because if you look at the harvesting of ice and you look at the uh, warehouse level manufacture of ice and then you look at the sort of distributing home appliances to make ice in the, uh, that, so that anybody can make ice, not one company made the transition. None of the shippers became warehouse companies. None of the warehouse companies became appliance companies. Although they were providing the same service for, the the, for, the, for their audiences, nobody was able to make that transition. Now let me so tell you a second story about uh, some companies that, that were. Um, not far from here, on the South Fork of the American River, uh, a man named James Marshall knelt down at that spot and discovered in 1848 gold. Uh, he didn't tell very many people but they didn't tell very many people, and eventually sort of the gold rush started, and everybody came here to San Francisco to get up into the hills to go get this gold. Um, it was crazy what happened to the city of San Francisco. It doubled uh, something like every six weeks for a, a number of years. Um, but to get here, it was difficult, right? Here's a bill saying uh, there's a steamship called the Nicaragua, um, and it takes something like, I don't know, where 35 days, right? You had to go all the way under to, uh, uh, to get here from the east coast of California or try the treacherous journey across. And for some reason, they're billing that 200 jackasses are going to come with you on the ship. And I don't know why. <laughs> I don't know why that's a good idea. It's some kind of asset here or something. But, um, but this, so the gold rush actually worked a lot like how the venture capital community here in, in the Bay Area in Silicon Valley works in that rich people in New York, where the, all the center of wealth would, was, would sign up people to go to California and fund them. Uh, in, in exchange for getting a, a percentage back, right? And so getting the people there was fine, but getting the money back was just way more important to these capitalists, right? Uh, they had to go all the way under 
Um, and it was a treacherous trip, and there were pirates and uh, you know shipwrecks and all that kind of stuff. It was bad for their for their returns on their investment. Uh, and so they started so they started looking for ways across to, to do it as quickly as possible. And that sort of resulted in what we ended up calling the Pony Express. And there were a couple companies that did this. One was American Express. They started this way. The other was a company called Wells Fargo, which is a bank that's uh, based here in California. Um, they actually kind of forged the route and, um, and cut the roads through the mountains and that kind of stuff to make this possible, uh, and turning themselves into shipping companies, but really, in effect, turning themselves into kind of these first uh, cross-country banks because they would have the money on both sides. Now, of course, again, technology moving. Once you have the roads all the way through, started stringing wires across that to bring the first telegraph surface um, and creating what we you know, often refer to as this Victorian internet, the first time we sort of strung up the world so that we could communicate with one another. What's really interesting about this is that Wells Fargo saw that coming. They were like, we are shipping gold with a guy sitting on top of the stagecoach with a gun, right? And we don't have to do that once the wires are connected, right? Once the wires are connected, we can keep all the gold here in San Francisco and just tell them in New York, right? We can send some information to New York saying, this is your money now. And they can have that money. And they turn the, date, the, the wealth into information. We're able to... to to do this in absolutely no time, whereas before it, took, it still took weeks. The amount of time that it took Wells Fargo to shift from stagecoaches with gold bars in them to, uh, to the telegraph wires, once the first telegraph was sent from San Francisco to New York, was two days. They were like, that's it. This is our new business. We're in it. We're done. And they stopped the horses. Um, keeping all the gold in San Francisco may not have been the best idea. That's the same building in 1906. Uh, they got the gold out, so that was fine. Um, but Wells Fargo has persisted and, and even made it through the financial crisis uh, uh, pretty well intact. In fact, acquired a few companies. So, so how did they make it? And how did American Express make it? And how did the, um, how did the ice companies not, right? Um, you see this happening all the time. It's a deep and profound understanding of the business that you're in and matching the user needs here, right? Matching the user needs regardless of how you are matching them now and how technolog technological disruption and innovation changes that and being able to respond to that all the time. So loads of examples of that happening today on the web. Um, let's just look at a couple, right? There was a, uh, a, sh a connection of technology that happened um, back in the 90s where computers started shipping with CD-ROMs. Uh, broadband happened, especially on ca college campuses. New compression technologies came out. You put those three things together and you have MP3s and Napster, right? And that fundamentally changed who was winning in the electronics game, um, as well as, right, a, a lot of our notions of what intellectual property really is. Uh, five years later, bandwidth increased five times. Uh, Flash, the, Adobe started um, putting video codecs into the Flash player. Uh, and the result is the 24-hour Peter Merholz channel. Look at that. <laughs> but fundamentally, <laughs> fundamentally, different, um, fundamentally different models start emerging, right, when that happens. I've been working on this now for about two years with the, with the company Typekit that we founded. Um, based on kind of 600 years of uh, typographic history, um, that fundamentally changed when the web started and literally had no control over fonts. Uh, over the course of the you know, 15 years that we've been doing web design, we got control of a few fonts because we kind of were able to assume that our audience had that. But the W3C had been working on technologies or specifications for how you could link to a font and send that font with the page and let the user see it, right? Something as simple as that. Uh, there was a lot of talk about it about two years ago, saying, all right, we should really do this now. And then there was browser implementations. Opera started first, but then it was built into Safari, it was built into Firefox, it was built into Chrome, and surprisingly, it even works in Internet Explorer. <laughs> in a traditional sort of Microsoft way in which they use a completely proprietary font format. But it still works, so that's good. Um, and the results now, we've seen all this amazing new creativity. Like, this is just text, right? Like, with grad CSS gradients put on it. But that's like an H1 that you can select and translate. It's searchable and all that kind of stuff. It's fantastic. We've seen, you know, blogs start uh, expressing themselves in much more stripped-down designs based on the beauty of the typography. And even large brands are now taking some of the assets that they've had for years, finally able to use them online. But of course, this is disruptive, right? Because it's putting the assets of the people who make these things right on the web, right? The, the font developers. And so many of the font, uh, the font foundries uh, opposed it at first. They were worried, right? Like this is, and it's a little bit different, actually, than the, the recording industry, where uh, an MP3 is a representation of a bunch of work. 
Um, in the font world, like a font is literally the entire source code. Every, every bit that they have put into creating that font is distributed over the web. So that was the sort of environment in which we were working when we created Typekit to work with foundries and to work with web designers and to hook them all together and to find a way through so that it was more like gold and less like ice, right? So if we take a step back and look at that, we can see, right? Um, whereas ice was at first thought it was about shipping and then about warehouses and finally about appliances, the reality was it was about people's health. It was about their quality of life. And being able to provide that for people was the thing that was actually, in the end, the most successful. Just like gold was not about shipping bars of gold around, but in fact, it was about communication, turning wealth into data, right? Being able to speed up the financial markets that way. And media, right? Like all the MP3s and video and all the stuff that's flying around the web now is not about the disks and the um, and the way in which it was distributed in the past, but it's really now about attention, right? It's about the fact that if something is popular, you might not be able to sell that thing, but you'll have people's attention while they're engaging with it, and you can do something with that that might actually result in some money, shifting all of these rules. So I want to look now at how that could really apply to what we do on the web today, and I want to look at one principle in particular um, that I've seen sort of emerge um, from the beginning of the web, but, but, but um, really taking steam lately. We'll talk about a couple others as well, um, if we have some time. But my thesis, like I said at the beginning, is I believe that the qualities that contribute, contribute to the success of the web are also the qualities that will make us successful too, if we can embody them, if we can profoundly understand them and use them in our work all the time. I call this being native to the web. Right? That means that we fundamentally understand the web, deep down, internally get it, so that when we are advocating for doing the right thing in our organizations or with our clients, right, we are arguing from a position of, I know what's right for the web, it will be right for our users, it's what's right for our organization. So let me show you um, a little bit about how the web has been created. There's a couple of standards bodies. One is called the IETF, the Internet Engineering Task Force. Another is called, you're probably familiar with the W3C, the IETF real low-level stuff like SMTP for email and Ethernet, right? That's, that's where those standards come from. But the W3C, you know, uh, HTML, CSS, that kind of stuff. And also, um, I, I wonder why standards bodies have logos that are just so pointy all the time. And I think any designers there want to do a pro bono project, it would be much appreciated to fix some of that. But the way they get this work done is fascinating. I did a bunch of it in the 90s. Um, I was on the, H, uh, the HTML4 and CSS2 working groups uh, as part of the, the, what I did for Wired Magazine. And this is what it looks like. This is, this is how the web is made right here. You go sit in some dreary conference room in a hotel somewhere, um, and one guy stands in the front, kind of moderates, and then people stand up and disagree with each other. And, um, and it is, uh, well, it's awful, to be perfectly honest. It's the most boring thing in the world. Incredibly important, and in retrospect, I'm so glad I've had experience, but just the mind-numbing -num minutia of what happens here is crazy. Everybody in this room, by default, disagrees with one another, right? Because they, they're competitors, right? Microsoft and Netscape and HP and Apple, and they're all sitting in this room of representatives from them. We're sitting here, but they all know that they want the same thing, right? So in the case of CSS, right, we, we all sort of knew that there should be some language to help describe the, the style of a page, and it should be separate from that page. Um, and that was going to be kind of how the web was going to evolve, right? And this is in 1996 or something like that. The web will evolve that way. So the guy from Netscape stands up and said, we've thought about this. Our latest browser just shipped, and it's got a thing in it called JavaScript, and it's really taking off. People like JavaScript. They're using it. It's a, way, it's a, it's a procedural way of controlling kind of how a web page behaves. So we think we should do the same for style, and so our proposal is JavaScript-based style sheets, and that's what they pr proposed to the working group at the W3C. And half of the room was like, I write code, make code, make stuff, you know, it's great. It's going to look like this, right? So if, if color red, make it bold and stuff like that, perfect. And if it doesn't work, you'll get an error and you can debug, and that's how you'll do design. Other half of the room where I was sitting was like, wait a minute. No, this is not how we do design, right? And, and this is going to require a set of skills that's not embodied in a lot of designers. Maybe there's a simpler, more declarative way that we can do that. And the argument starts happening back and forth, back and forth. You don't get anywhere with it, really, uh, except for everybody kind of understanding both sides of the, of the problem. Later that night, uh, uh, as we do you know, things like this, you know, go out for dinner with everybody and then end up in the pub. And, um, and I remember looking over 
at a, at a booth and seeing a guy from Microsoft and a guy from Netscape with these giant early laptop computers, and they're doing stuff, right, and drinking beer and, uh, and typing. And I'm like, wow, what are those guys doing? It's like midnight. Um, the next morning, we get back in that dreadful room, and the, the, the two guys stand up from Microsoft and Netscape, and they say, we both have builds of our browsers now. We'd like to distribute them all. Uh, we've come to a uh, sort of this middle ground. It's kind of declarative, and there's, there's a language, a syntax, and everybody try it. And we all get the software and try it out, and it was tangible. And you could see, like, I can write some stuff. I don't have to just think and take an ideological position. I can see which works better, what works better. And that really, really is how all of this happens in the, in the W3C, right? There is some consensus that needs to happen, and then you can get agreement, and things like the standard can come out, like, like it did years later. That's a principle for how the web works, how the web was built. It's called rough consensus and running code. Those are the two things you need. Nobody's going to agree, but we did all have consensus that we needed style. The way in which consensus turned into agreement was by getting essentially prototypes into people's hands, the running code. You could use it, and once you could use it, you could, it was tangible. You could make stuff. I'll give you another quick early history of the web. This comes from Mark Pilgrim, who wrote uh, Dive into Python, Dive into HTML5. He's, he's at Google now, fantastic writer. He did some archaeology, some digital archaeology of the W3C mailing list, or actually the web mailing list from the 19, early 1990s. This is from February 25 of 1993. Some college kid in, uh, in uh, Illinois uh, proposing something for a browser that he's working on that's going to be called Mosaic. His name is Mark Andreessen. Maybe you've heard of him. Um, he said, I'd like to propose a new optional HTML tag called image. The required argument is source equals URL. And we didn't have images at the time on the web, literally. You could link to one and it would open in some viewer, but you couldn't put an image on a web page. And he's proposing that we should do this. Um, and as a college kid, if you have a better idea than what I'm presenting now, <laughs> please let me know. I was like 19, right? And so, um, so a guy named Tony Johnson, who's over at Stanford, writes back and says, ah, I've been thinking about this too. My browser is called Midas, and I've got Icon with an href. Um, and then Tim Berners-Lee, because this is the web mailing list, and Tim Berners-Lee isn't a famous guy yet in 1993. Um, but he's on the list, and he says, oh, yeah, I've been thinking about images as well. Uh, but I hadn't wanted a special tag, and he makes some other proposal. So clearly there's consensus, right? It's rough consensus. We want to do images somehow, but nobody can agree how. Uh, so then, um, about six weeks later, Mark Andreessen posts back to the list and says, well, I'm getting close to releasing the first version of Mosaic, which is going to support inline images. Uh, so we're probably going to go with what I proposed. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so the, argue, the sort of debate kind of went on for what would be the best thing to do, and eventually, like, the, he wins, right? Because he ships some code and it gets into people's hands, and they're like, oh, all right, I see how this works. It's, it could be better. You could abstract it, make it object, and anything could be in line. But we went with this because it was simple, and he, and he shipped it first. Um, and literally made history. Of, uh, a few weeks later, he shipped Mos the... Um, Mosaic browser, and literally um, made history. There's a plaque that says, the first web browser was made here. <laughs> so rough consensus running code, a fundamental principle for how the web works, but also a great way for us to do product development. So let me give you a, a, a very brief, like the first few weeks when we were working on Typekit uh, back uh, earlier last year, um, where we were going to sort of embody this principle. We had this idea that it could work, right? You could, you could actually make a service that did fonts on the web and get some of the foundries to go together. And so literally the first few days, we, we like talked about it in very big picture and we sketched out about a bunch of ideas. These are um, uh, pages from Jason Santa Maria, our creative director, his uh, notebook. This is not my work. I could never do such a thing. Um, but literally by the end of the first week, we had visualized kind of what it could look like, right? We, all right, so we could have... Um, you know, this is how we would explain it to people. Uh, this is maybe how it would start to function. These are some of my chicken scratches. Um, but this would, you know, maybe this would be how it works. All right, let's get into Photoshop. So week two, we sort of make it into Photoshop. And immediately as, as we have these, we start sending them around, and I get on the phone with web designers that I know all over the place. Like, hey, here, what, what, if you saw this, what would you think? If you saw this, right? Uh, how would you use it? Uh, we even mocked up in Photoshop our business model. How about this, right? And, and shared that with everybody. Um, we had not written any code yet. Um, we just had like the sense that, you know what, like if we could make this tangible, there was lots and lots of consensus in the world that, that fonts were going to work on the web. Uh, we wanted to get there first, so we went really fast and just made some prototypes, showed it to people. Uh, and then did something we'd never done before, which was we just wrote a blog post about it and kind of put it out on Twitter and said, here's everything we're going to do. Still, hadn't written any code yet. 
um, but wanted to see, right? Is this a good idea? And it turns out it was, right? We were a um, trending topic on Twitter that day, which kind of blew our minds that web fonts would be that cool, but also, you know, Susan Boyle and three words after sex are also <laughs> trending topics, so like, get a hold of the ego, right? Um, but what happened is we got a tremendous amount of feedback. Half of it saying, best, thing, best idea in the world, the other half doomed to fail. So that made me feel good as well, because if it was all in the middle, it, would have been, it wouldn't have been as exciting at all. Um, but basically, everybody who thought we were going to fail gave us a list of things that we would have to do. So we had our marching orders, and that was great. Um, and Twitter is an amazing place for this. Like, I literally spend an hour every morning reading all the tweets that mention Typekit. So if you want my attention, that's a great, great way to do it. But I do every day, because it is real time, honest to goodness, customer feedback. Um, as, as blatant as possible, either good or bad, because you only have 140 characters to do it. Um, so we went fast, and we iterated as fast as we could, and literally launched with the minimum viable product that we could. That's the simplest thing that we could, and then continued to iterate after that. I love this quote. If you're not embarrassed with the, when you ship your product, you've waited too long. That's from Reid Hoffman. <laughs> Reid Hoffman is the uh, CEO of, uh, or he was the CEO of LinkedIn. Um, and it's true, right? And I, now I know, like, this really quick iteration, uh, it's easy for you to say, oh, yeah, great, Mr. Startup, but I work at this big company, and we have all this process and all that kind of stuff. Um, but look at these other giant internet brands when they got started. Like, Google literally was apologizing, right? Like, we had 25 million pages, but soon we're going to be much bigger, right? Um, we, you saw a version of this is um, Facebook, right, uh, four or five years ago. Uh, we saw a version of this earlier today, um, but literally only worked in Harvard, and then a couple more colleges before they ran out. So really the minimum viable thing. This is the homepage of Amazon when they launched. What, what's missing here? Books. I know. <laughs> How many books? Um, I love this little joke. This is the Apple Lisa uh, homepage at Apple back in uh, 1989, I think, or 83. I, I found this on Flickr. I thought it was funny. Not really their first homepage, but it's hilarious. Like, um, look, pre-order the iPhone. That's pretty cool, <laughs> this thing. <laughs> but look at this quote here. I'm running a little out of time, so I'm going a little fast here. But the velocity and responsiveness of your team to user feedback will set the tone for your software. Responsiveness, velocity, right? More than any single release ever could. And that's what you have to get good at, says Jeff, Jeff Atwood at Coding Horror. I mean, Twitter is fantastic at this, right? They have looked for patterns in what their users are doing and built features that literally layer right on top of them, like, Here's the tweet where the, at, or the, where the hashtag was first introduced by Chris Messina. They turned that into a feature. At replies, exactly, right? Like, people are using this behavior. We're going we're gonna to go on top of that. Uh, retweets, the same thing. Um, the reality is, I believe this fundamentally, the speed of iteration beats the quality of iteration. The faster that we can go and do product development with tangible code that we can show to our users, the more successful we're going to be because we can learn so much faster. Right? And that's that idea of rough consensus. Right? You, we generally have an idea. We've done some user research. We know what the market wants. Right? We're going to put that uh, into this sort of process of running code as quickly as possible. There are tons and tons of other principles. I wish we had more time to talk about. I could talk about them all day. Um, but look at this, for example, which is a, an, uh, uh, an RFC from the early days of the internet that embodies a, a fantastic principle for the web in that we should be liberal in what we accept and conservative in what we send. It's how they built the fundamental protocols of the web. It's the robustness principle from John Postel, right? It's an amazing principle. It's fundamental to how the web works. How about small pieces loosely joined, right? That's how units works. That's how the web works. That's why we have APIs, right? Um, how about this? Information wants to be free. Another amazing principle that came from Stuart Brand, but predates him even, and goes on and on. All of this, right? All of these principles, if you dig in and, and read about any one of them and internalize them, make us better at what we do at building the web. And I think the web, I think this is pretty important, right? I said from the beginning, like, I've dedicated my career to the web. Uh, and it's not just like, this is, a, this is a new thing that we're going to do with our business now, and we're going like, you know, to try to be a little more engaged with our customers. I think the web is pretty fundamental to kind of human culture now. And I know that can sound like hyperbole, but, but I really believe that we are kind of finding a new way of not replacing the relationships that we have between each other and the intimacy that we have, but amplifying it, right? And it is, it is really kind of fundamentally changing um, a lot of human culture. Uh, the web is a place where our most precious uh, memories and experiences are recorded now. We don't have physical representations of stuff anymore. We put it on the web, right? And it's all there, and we trust that it'll always be there. 
we are writing human history collaboratively, kind of for the first time ever, right? And we're doing it on the web, right? And the web is about to spill out, right? Spill out of our browsers and our uh, and our, uh, our phones and stuff, and into the real world, right? And, and the web is going to be, this, this data is going to be all around us and overlaying us everywhere. So I believe, like, the web is a pretty fundamentally different thing. And I think, actually, that it's so fundamentally different that the people who make the web, the people like all of us at a conference like this, have a responsibility to sort of protect the web from the kinds of bad decisions and bad ideas that it bombarded every day, the threats to the web. I mean, Wired Magazine, just this month, is proclaiming the web to be dead, right? I, I think Chris Anderson couldn't be farther off this time. It's ridiculous. But it's a, but it's a meme, right? And they're, and they're replacing it with, with not an open and free and accessible web, right, but a closed web, walled gardens, places where the web can be safe. And we can warn people to be careful of what's out there. Stay inside, right, where it's, where it's safe here. Or, handing people a business model, right? As long as you use the right coding language and submit to a, essentially a censorship process, we'll give you a business model. And you don't have to worry about the web anymore. This is the way we'll deliver everything, right? There's also, I mean, it's a fundamental shift in how power and wealth is being distributed in the world. And there's people that want it to be like it was in the 20th century and say, no, like these changes, I'm not going to let them happen. And I think I'm still powerful enough to get it done. And that's what Rupert wants to do. And a lot of people like him want to do that. And then there's just other companies that, frankly, don't give a shit. That if the, pow if the, if the, the memories, right, the, the stuff, that's, that those connections are, that are so valuable to us, if they don't meet the bottom line and we can't afford the servers anymore, just shut it all off. You know, what could, what could matter? So I think every time you make a decision, right, that you're faced with some decision in your organization where you're thinking, which way do we go, right? Do we follow one of these paths that doesn't seem to resonate with how the web works? Or do we do it the right way, right? Do we serve our users in a way that's fundamental, that is native to the web, right? Whether it is in a business development negotiations, whether it's choosing to use web standards or some other technology, whether it's uh, doing user research or, or simply you know, going the way we always have. It's our responsibility to do this. Um, I've dedicated my, my career to the web, and I love the web, and I really hope you guys do too, because we have so much of it left to build. Thank you very much.